Okay, so uh, my experience with religion early on in life was was rare. It was like not real. There wasn't much religion in my in my home in my family. We barely went to church. Kind of talked about God. Like I remember as a young kid, we would pray a little bit, um, but it was just like a bedtime thing, and it was in Romanian, and I didn't really understand it. So I was like, eh, whatever. Uh, but on paper, we were Romanian Orthodox right? That was our religion. So if you asked me when I was a kid, what religion are you? I would have said orthodox, but I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that was. I just, that's just what my grandma told me. So that's what I was. And um, as a kid growing up, we went to weddings and we went to baptisms, which I told you guys before, but baptisms for me, like when I went to a baptism in the orthodox church, it was just so weird, man. Like, the baby's naked. Why is the baby naked? Why does the baby always have to be naked? And then they just dunk him in the tub and they're just screaming and wailing and there's water flying everywhere. I'm like, this is barbaric. So, you know, my first experience of church was that. Naked baby being drowned. You know, so I was like, what is this? What is this religion? This is so strange to me. And then, you know, there's weddings and the funerals, but it was always at the Orthodox Church. So as a kid growing up into a teenager, my initial thoughts about religion was, I don't really get it. The building's nice right? There's some nice architecture, stained glass windows, but I didn't really get it. It was weird. But in, a, in another sense, it was sort of comforting to me as well. And you might think, well, what's so comforting about it? Just bear with me here. Early in life, what happened to me was a superstitious, I'm convinced, a superstitious spirit was put into me, very young. And It was all just about superstition. That's all, you know, my mother, my grandmother, it was all just this sort of superstitious thing. Um, You know, if you would have went into my house as a kid, you would have seen in every room pictures. Well, they were like, uh, if anybody knows about like the Orthodox Church, there's like these, they're not framed pictures, but they're like, some, some of them are oval, some of them are squares, but they have chains. They call them icons, you know. And so in every room we had these icons of Jesus and Mary. Some of them were just Jesus. Some of them were just Mary. Some of them were both. Some of them were other religious figures. But they were in every single room of the house. There had to be, even in the bathroom, which was kind of weird for me. But, um, and then we had crosses uh, hanging in every car, every rear view mirror. And there was a tradition, at least in my family, where when you turn 18 years old, you get a golden cross. Like, it has to be real gold, right? So a golden cross, my mom gave me this on my birthday, and she made a big deal, big deal about it, right? She's like, you know, well, you're 18 now. So here's the gifts that we, we get when we're 18. So I'm thinking, well, what is it? And I'm like, it's just the cross. Like, I thought it was going to be something extravagant. Now, I'm not a believer, so I don't really care at the time, right? I'm like, Oh, okay, thanks, mom, you know, whatever. But I kind of like, she made a big deal of it, so I'm like, okay, there must be some sort of, so what I did with that thing is I put it under my bed, and I was like, okay, it's going to protect me. I believed it was going to protect me because I had this superstitious spirit. So when I I became born again, when when, when I accepted the Lord Jesus in my early 20s, I still had this sort of superstitious background, and it was interesting to me as I actually began to read the Bible that the superstitious, um, uh, habits or these superstitious traditions weren't in here. So I'm looking for it. You know, I'm like, so when's it going to tell me about the icons? When's it going to tell me about the, about the golden cross? When's it going to, wh- but it's just not there. I didn't find, I still haven't found it. It's not there. So what, what I actually found out was the Bible actually denounces these superstitious things. So it was the opposite of what I've been taught my whole life. You know, th- there's a lot of man-made religions out there. There's a lot of man-made traditions, and they come in various forms, but there's an easy way to discern between it all. The Bible tells us that Christ is the substance of faith. And if you're not being constantly pointed to Jesus Christ as your sufficiency, then you can be sure there's some man-made religion behind it. One thing I never heard growing up was Christ. Isn't that ironic? The one thing I never heard growing up was Jesus is, is, is the solution. You know, Jesus died for your sins. Jesus is, is the substance. This is what it's all about. I never heard about that. But that's what's actually in the book. So how about we open up the book and let me read from it so that you don't have to trust what I say, but you can actually know that it's from the book. 
So uh, we're going to go to Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 16, and we'll just read two verses for now. So verse 16 to 17, it says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So in the previous passages that we talked about last week, Paul tells us that Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities. Christ put to open shame the demons and the devils and the principalities of hell. When he died on the cross, he disarmed them by giving you a new heart. So the sin that dwells in your heart, Christ disarms them by removing that sin and giving you his righteousness. So now the devil has nothing really to work with it, with you anymore because it's like, well, Christ gave you his righteousness, so the devil's like, what do I do with this person now? I don't have any ammunition against them. So he disarms the devil when he dies on the cross. So now Paul's telling us that because Christ has won the victory in our behalf, that we, not, we should not allow anyone to pass judgment on us. Okay, asterisk time, because this is important. <laughs> um, he's not talking about like a sort of sweeping judgment, you know, like, like everybody talks about the Tupac song, only God can judge me. That's kind of true, but that's not very comforting <laughs> because if you're in your sin, you don't want God to judge you. Okay, so it's not a sweeping judgment. Sometimes people will judge us and they're going to be right in their judgment, okay? If you're married and if you're a man especially, you know that's true, <laughs> right? Um, your wife will judge you. And she'll be right most of the time in her judgment about you. So it's not a matter of, of don't judge me ever. Sometimes we need to be judged and corrected. And that's not a bad thing. And then that's a good thing. We should receive the correction and, and move on and do the right thing. Sometimes people will judge us. It'll be wrong and unrighteous. And so then we, you know, we reject that. But we need to be able to discern between right judgment and wrong judgment. So... In this case, Paul is referring to issues about food, drink, and religious observances. So context is helpful here. Okay, in the Old Testament, there's a handful of laws. Okay, that's like literally like a handful. There's a lot of laws in the front of the book. Six, thank you, Dave. 613 laws that, the God, that God gives Israel to obey. And many of these laws have to do with food and drink and many of them have to do with festivals and holidays and religious observances. So, for example, the scriptures tell us that, that Jews must not eat pork. Okay, so in the Old Testament it says don't eat pork. And then it gives another list of foods that uh, Israel was not to eat. Um, it also tells them to keep feast days such as the Day of Atonement. So I want to talk about the Day of Atonement, for, for example. In Leviticus 16 it tells us a little bit about the Day of Atonement. It says... And it shall be a statute to you forever, that's interesting, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. So God institutes the day of atonement. He gives them the month and the day when they're to observe this day. So what happens on the Day of Atonement is the high priest offers a goat to make atonement for the sin. So you bring a goat or a lamb or whatever to the high priest, and if you couldn't afford a goat lamb, God made a, a certain um, uh, exception for you. You could bring whatever, uh, a dove or whatever, and you bring it, and the priest takes the animal and kills it. And the blood makes atonement for the sin. So... This was to remind the people, one, they're sinners, and two, that sin is the reason they die, and three, the penalty for sin is death. And so what happens is you, get the, you give the animal, and the animal goes in your place and dies. So, you know, we go to church, right? You get up on Sunday, you get your Bible, you get in your car, or on your, on your bike, or you walk, and you come into church, and it's nice. Dave sings some songs. <laughs> no, I think it's nice. I think, I think you do a nice job. And we fellowship and we pray, and it's nice, right? It's peaceful. But for the Israelites, the worship experience, especially the Day of Atonement, was <laughs> not so nice. It was a violent and bloody affair. 
animals and blood and sacrifice and this like it wasn't like let's all bring kids to the temple and have a wonderful day of atonement it was get the goat we were raising for all year so we could go kill it because we're sinners so it was like a very visual reminder for the people like sin is really bad and god is is not uh, 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 lax about sin very visual reality of the heinousness of sin. Sin, br- sin brings death, and they saw it every year. They, ha- they had to experience it every year on the Day of Atonement. So, arguments would arise within the churches after Jesus ascended to heaven. People would argue about the holy days and the feasts, and some would say, you know, you, we need to keep the, the, the feast days. Okay, I know, we know Christ came, he died, but the Bible says it's a feast day forever, right? We just read that. That was David told me, a, a statute for you forever. So God didn't do away. So we have to keep the feast days, and the arguments would go back and forth, and, 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 someone, and, and some would say, no, you don't need to, and some would say, we need to also keep the dietary laws. So, so if you're a Christian, for you to eat pork, it's a sin. So don't eat pork. Now, personally, I try not to eat pork, for other reasons, but not because it's a sin reason. But, so, so, but they would argue, it's a sin for Christians to eat pork. Why? Because it's in the Bible. True, it's in the Bible, but is it a sin? Is eating pepperoni a sin? Anybody eat pepperoni last night? This morning? And you came to church? After you ate pepperoni? Oh my goodness. Terrible. So, I'm just kidding, by the way. So don't feel bad. If you eat pepperoni, you could still come, I promise. Um, we'll get there. Okay, so think about our holy days, okay? So, of course, a lot of us, you know, we're, is there any ethnic Jews here, actually? Ethnic Jews? No? So we've never, ex- you know, celebrated Day of Atonement. We've ne- we've, I've never, you know, observed these, uh, these, these days. So we have our, 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 our holy days, if you will, and Christmas is just around the corner, and it actually is. It's, it's like under 60 days away, so, you know, we're getting close. Um, and some Christians out there, and I know I can count them on one hand, but they're out there, and, and they'll try to convince you it's a sin to celebrate Christmas. It's a sin. Don't do it. Christmas is, they'll say, a secret, hidden, pagan festival. And if you have a Christmas tree that you're unknowingly participating in pagan, demonic uh, festival. Now, that's a serious charge. You can't just go around telling people, if you have a Christmas tree, you're like inviting the devil into your house. I mean, that's, the, that's, that's a serious charge, right? But, but both are serious charges. If I say eating pork is a sin and having a Christmas tree is a sin, it's both a sin, it's both a serious charge. And we know how serious sin is to God. So they're serious accusations. But when we come to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, we see Paul say, let no one pass judgment on you concerning what? Food and festivals. So if you eat pork, no one can judge you for that. If you don't observe the Day of Atonement, no one can judge you for that. If you have a Christmas tree, no one can judge you for that. But why? I mean, unless you're actually like bowing before it and worshiping it. But last I checked, no one does that. And if you are, stop. But no one does that. The law of God tells us that the Israelites couldn't eat pork and God himself established the Day of Atonement. God even said of the Day of Atonement and many other holy days in the Bible that they're everlasting, they're forever. So what gives? Is there a contradiction? What's happening here? Why is Paul now saying no one can pass a judgment on you concerning these things? The answer is in the next verse. He says, these, the dietary laws, the festivals, and so forth, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The feast days, the holy days, the dietary laws, they're a shadow of the things to come. When the Jews would bring a goat or a lamb or whatever it was to, to offer on the Day of Atonement, th- they did it every year. You know why? Because it wasn't sufficient. It wasn't sufficient to, to, to cleanse them. 
That's why they had to repeat it every year, every year, every year. They had to repeat this, this, this thing. And, and, and it wasn't that the blood of goats or lambs could actually take away their sins. It, it, it never. But it was a reminder to them that sin is serious and death is the penalty for sin. And there needs to be a sacrifice that's sufficient. So it pointed forward to something greater. And when we get to Jesus, what does John say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's the substance. There's the substance. The goats, the, the, the Day of Atonement, the, the, that was the shadow, but the shadow points to the object, the substance of what it's all about, and it was Jesus. It was the cross. It was the resurrection. So now, actually, if you celebrate the Day of Atonement, it kind of is a sin. It kind of is a sin because Jesus took your sin away. The, a goat can't take your sin away. Jesus did it. He's the substance, and it belongs to him. So yes, the Day of Atonement is an everlasting statute, found, which finds its fulfillment in Jesus. The true Day of Atonement was the Day of the Cross. That's the Day of Atonement, and it lasts forever. So God wasn't lying. He was just pointing you forward to something greater. It was a shadow, but the substance belongs to Christ. He shed his blood. He's the Lamb of God, and his blood takes away all of our sins and forgives us forever. Once for all, he doesn't need to do it again. It's finished. Remember when he said it is finished? He meant it. He meant it. He's the substance of all the law and all the prophets. Of course, like I don't have time to go through every law in the Bible and, and every holy day of the Old Testament and demonstrate how Christ is the substance of all of it, but he is. And if you want to have that discussion, we can have that discussion and I can point you to resources that show you. And it's a, it's a, it's a crazy study when you see it's like, wow the way that Christ fulfills it all. It's, it's amazing. But just suffice it to say here that Christ is the fulfillment. So let no one, he says, let no one pass judgment on you concerning these things. He's the substance of the shadow. No one glorifies the shadow, right? That would be silly. I always think of the sea and tower when I think of this scripture. It's like, you ever see the picture, pictures of the shadow of the sea and tower? It's a pretty cool shadow. It's really big, right? But nobody like goes to Toronto to take pictures of the shadow. They go to take pictures of the tower. The shadow just testifies that the tower is there. It's a cool shadow, right? It's, you know, it's pretty big. It's impressive. But what's more impressive is the actual thing. No one glorifies the shadow. No, no one says, wow, what a great shadow. No, they say, wow, what a great object. You know, when I got married... My wife was wearing a nice dress, and she was all done up and looked really nice. And she did cast a shadow. But could you imagine if I'm standing at the altar, and she walks up, and I go, wow, what a nice shadow. That would be ridiculous. No one does that, because there's the real thing in front of you. Their prophet, the, you know, the Old Testament is profitable for us to study, to see how, it f how Christ fulfills it, but it should drive us to him not to a, a legalistic observance of the ri ri ritual religious rites that, that point to him. Christ is the substance. He's the Savior. So don't let anyone pass judgment on you concerning these things. And Christmas is coming, and, and there will be those people on my Facebook who keep posting the thing about the tree. And I'm just going to take a picture of my tree and say, look at my nice tree. God bless you. And it's not pagan, okay, unless you actually worship it, but no one does that. So put the tree up. Just don't worship it. Worship Jesus. And we're good, okay? Pretty simple. So don't be deceived by the legalism. He's the substance and the only source of spiritual growth. So in the same vein as legalism, which is like do this, do this, do this, you must observe, you must observe, is the other side of the coin, which is something called sensuous religion. And Paul deals with it in verse 18. He says this. Uh, many verses, uh, 18 to 19, he says this. Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up, with, uh, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. So the first question is, you know, what is asceticism? Asceticism. What's that word? What does it mean? Fair question. Because in our culture, asceticism isn't really an issue, 
Right? We don't have an asceticism. Asceticism issue. We have the opposite problem. Asceticism, as, ah, I can't even say the word. Asceticism, I said it wrong again. That word is defined as strict self-control as a means of spiritual discipline. Comes from a Greek word which means exercise or training. So it's like religious training in a sense. It's strictly adhering or abstaining from certain things as a form of spirituality. Now, at first glance, it sounds good, right? Like, yeah, there are things we, sh- we should abstain from because they're dangerous and they're, 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 they're unrighteous and unholy and stuff. So what's wrong with this? After all, it's good to be spiritually disciplined and stuff like that, of course. But this is not a spiritual discipline that leads to godliness. It's a spiritual discipline that is like fleshly. It's like another form of legalism in a sense. It would have you abstain from things that are okay in the name of being more spiritual. Now, there are certain earthly pleasures that are not sinful to partake in, like, like food. You know? uh, if you want to put uh, you know, some spice on your, on your food so it tastes better, that's okay. It's not a sin. Do it. Enjoy the food. But some would say, no, no, no. No pleasure allowed at all. You know, uh, the Roman Catholic Church forbids priests from marrying. That's a form of asceticism. Don't marry. Be 100% strict. No marriage, just boom, 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 boom. Do your religious thing and that's it. It's a sensuous religion. Now, even priests in the Old Testament were married. So, it's a sensuous religion because it demands things from people that God never demands. God never said don't get married. Never. Never once to anybody. Except for, you know, in a few instances where they were eunuchs or whatever. But for the most part, he's, he did not forbid marriage uh, across the board for religious service. He hasn't done it. So, it fills in the blanks where God does not require abstinence from a thing. It forces you to abstain you want to be a priest? No marriage. Why? God never told me. He never said that. Then there's the other side of the coin. It's that religion that's obsessed with the material realm and gets caught up in emotions a little too much. Right? Paul mentions people here who, he says, worship angels and those who go on with many details about their many visions. I remember going to this one church. Like I was a new, newer believer at the time, and I went to this one church, and they were meeting in the Holiday Inn on Huron Church Road there. And if you've been to the Holiday Inn there, you know, you walk through the doors, and there's the service desk here, and then you walk forward, and there's some stairs that go around and around to the basement. There's a bunch of meeting rooms in there. And as I walked through the first doors, I could hear this, like, chaos, loud screaming. I'm like, what is going on? So I'm like, is that where we're going? So I walk in, and, 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 and it's in the basement. I'm like, oh, maybe that is where we're going. And it gets louder and louder and louder as I'm going, and I'm going down the stairs. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to really go here because I'm kind of scared what's going on. And so eventually we get into the room, and it's just chaos chaos people were all just screaming in tongues and just i couldn't understand anything and it was so loud and the guy at the front was also screaming in tongues but he had a microphone so it was even louder and i'm like what is going on so i went in the back corner and i'm just observing this thing and it was the most chaotic scene i've ever look i have three kids under three i know chaotic scenes I know what a chaotic scene is, screaming and yelling and, and chaos, but this was more chaotic than even my house. So that says something, okay? Absolutely most chaotic thing. So the pastor gets up after it sort of settles, and he starts, he starts to speak about speaking in tongues. Like, okay, what's this about? And he went on and on about visions and about details and about emotional experiences he had. And, and he invited all those. Yeah, he said, you know, if you haven't spoken in tongues, come to the front and we'll teach you to practice how to speak in tongues. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even know where to start. So I'm just going to kind of not, you know. But, so, but I was intrigued by it a little bit. I'm like, what's going on? Uh, how do you practice like a heavenly language? Like, is there a book? Like, is there a manual to practice? I, I was just very confused. It was very bizarre to me. And, and, and then there was another time I went to a gathering where, where you're going to think I'm lying. I'm not lying. This really happened, okay? I went to another gathering. It was in someone's house. He had a rather big house. So he had a big, a big basement. But there was a woman there who requested prayer 
for supernatural weight loss. She wanted to lose weight, and she thought, if they pray for me, I can supernaturally lose some weight. And I'm like, I don't, like God can do all things, but I don't know that he wants to do that. <laughs> um, so this is literally what happened. So the, the guy, the pastor said, hold on to your pants, because when I pray, you're going to lose weight, and they might fall. Okay, so... <laughs> So he's, she's holding on, and he's praying, and I'm like, is this really going to happen? Like, is she going to lose weight? Like, is she just going to, like, shrink? Okay. Um, after, <laughs> she didn't. After the meeting, guess what we all did? We ate pizza. We ate pizza. Do you understand how backwards that is? Like, pray that God would help, you know, melt melt the weight off my body, and then after we'll just eat some pizza. Like, what are you thinking? And this is why people don't go to church, man, because of this craziness. No one lost weight that night. As a matter of fact, we probably all gained weight that night. There's already a supernatural process for weight loss built into your body. It's already there. Just be in a calorie deficit. You know, if your body needs 2,600 calories a day, eat 25 Hundred and guess what will happen? You'll lose weight. Trust me, it works. Every time it works, I promise. Because God has built into your body a system by which you can gain weight and lose weight. This is how he made it. And it works every time. The one thing I remember about both those ministries, the chaotic one and the kind of, well, they're both kind of weird, but the both thing I remember about both, this, both the ministries was this. They preach the same thing. If you don't have enough faith, like us, to speak in tongues or to command weight to be lost, then you don't have the Spirit of God like us. That was the same underlying message was we have faith, and if you don't, that's the reason why you're not like us. But the Bible tells me here, to not let anyone, what does it say? What did I read? Do not let anyone disqualify you on the basis of sensuous religion. My standing with God does not depend on me being strictly disciplined in abstinence to things that God never forbade me from participating in. These are the two sides of the sensuous religious coin and both need to be rejected. Paul tells us, that those who are sensuous are not holding fast to the head. They're not seeking to worship God. They're, they're, no, rather, they are seeking to worship God apart from Christ or by adding to Christ. Abstaining from something God doesn't require abstinence from will not gain you any more favor with, Christ, with God. It won't. There's only one who's gained you favor with God, and his name is Jesus. And it's based solely on his death and resurrection. And that's it. You cannot add to that. Christ didn't die on the cross and rise from the dead and say, oh, there's a few other things you need to do. You know, I went through all of that, but by the way, don't eat pepperoni. Like, what, what kind of nonsense is that? By the way, you know, fill in the blank. He's the substance of all truth and all growth, Christ and Christ alone. So don't let anyone disqualify you. Let no one, let no one project their extra biblical rules and regulations on you as if you need to live up to their standards. You don't. There's only one standard you need to live up to, and that's God's. And you can't. That's why he died. <laughs> now, a word of warning. You know, if there are... Uh, if, if, if people are instructing you from the scriptures and, and maybe you are in sin legitimately and they're saying God said this, maybe you should heed this advice from the word, then of course you listen to it. Now what Paul is speaking of here is adding to the works of Jesus or taking away from the works of Jesus. Christianity gets a bad name because of these two extremes. It seems like it's either you become a Christian and people think you have to abstain from everything right, except for wearing head coverings and going to church, or in potlucks, because we're Baptists, so we have to go to potlucks. It's spiritual. So either you abstain from everything about potlucks and Bible studies, or you become a Christian, and now you can just do whatever you want. These are the two extremes we hear about. But they're both wrong. 
They're both not what the Bible tells us. So we have to reject both extremes and realize that it's Christ who's the substance and look to what he has done and what he has said and, and seek to live a life that's consistent with the reality that, my goodness, he's actually alive. That should change us if we believe he's actually alive. Because who, who else did that? Who else rose from the dead? I, I, I don't know, only him. He's the head of the church, not man-made rules. So don't be deceived by legalism and sensuous religion. And remember, Christ is the substance of all truth. He's the head of the church. It's true spiritual growth is only found in him and not in man-made religion. Verse 20 here, he says this. With, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. There are some words in the English language that are small words, but have huge implications. One of those words is if. Two, two letters, I-F, if. If assumes something is true, though in reality it may not be. Paul says, if you died to the elemental spirits, why then do you still submit to man-made religion? Paul wants us to think about it. Like, think about this, guys. How can A be true and B? If A, you die to the world, then how can B, you still obey man-made religion, also be true? A and B don't fellowship with each other. <laughs> they don't go together. It can't happen. Look at what Paul says. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Uh, these are legalistic regulations of man. Don't do this, don't do that, don't taste that, don't touch that. These are all Man-made nonsense, not in the Word of God. The issue here is the method by which we seek spiritual growth, and my oh my, do people seek it in crazy ways. Here's one example. In the Philippines, there's a group of people who actually reenact the passion of the Christ. Now, many churches will put on plays and musicals and dramas where they reenact the cross. That's not what I'm talking about. They actually reenact it. Like they actually, do you know what I'm saying? Okay, I'm going to show you a picture. It's not as gruesome as what I showed you, but I'm going to show you a picture. They actually walk down the streets carrying a cross, okay, and they're whipped and they're beat, and they're actually for real nailed to a cross, for real. Like that's real. That's a real guy in the Philippines who's really being nailed to a cross. They reenact the, 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 the story with real nails, real people, real crosses, real wood, real flesh, and they're hung up for all to see. In one article I read, it says that the wounds they sustain, and they do it every year, right? The wounds they sustain can take up to two weeks to heal, but the participants say, listen to what they say, they say it's a small price to pay to give thanks to God. Isn't that interesting? Now, that's an extreme example of asceticism. But the underlying uh, motivation here is the problem. It's the attitude that says, I have to do something to gain God's favor. It's a small price to pay to give thanks to God. What you do? He already paid the price. How are you going to, there's no price you need to pay to give thanks to God. All you have to do is, thank you, Lord. That's it. And you don't need to take two weeks off of work to heal from your crucifixion. You just thank the Lord for what he's done. But it goes even further. It says, not, it, it doesn't just say I must do something to gain God's favor. It says I must do something that God never required of me to gain his favor. That's even crazier. God never said crucify yourself to show. Well, he did say crucify your flesh, but he didn't mean that. <laughs> he meant put sin to death in your life. God never said don't get married to show me how thankful you are. God never said don't get pepperoni on your pizza to show, you how thankful, to show me how thankful you are. He never said that. 
Now look how Paul finishes here in verse 23. These have indeed, check this out, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, pretty severe. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Could you imagine? Like, I want to meet this guy and say, hey, you know, that, that, was, that was something you just did there, but it kind of has no value. <laughs> it was kind of a waste of time. Oh, man, that, that, I went through all that for, yeah, you went through all that for nothing. God is not any more pleased with you <laughs> because of that. The, these outward extreme regulations, they have an appearance of wisdom. Many look at the ultra-religious, those, you know, those who never touch alcohol, although God never said drinking alcohol was a sin. He said drunkenness is a sin, right? Um, he never looks at those who don't eat pork like, oh, wow, you're so spiritual. Or, or those who observe certain holidays. You know, some of us, we look at them and go, wow, wow, look at them. Like, they never touched alcohol, even though there's alcohol and hand sanitizer. Um, but, wow, look at these people. They're so spiritual. They're so, they're so wow. We, we, but the fact is, it's the appearance of wisdom. It's like a Halloween costume. It's like they're dressing up as wisdom. But then, you know, they, they take it off and it's like, oh, it was, just, it was fake. It wasn't real. It's only uh, an appearance. It's only promoting self-made religion. It has no value in stopping what needs to be stopped, sin. <laughs> it has no value in stopping that. Uh, the reformer Martin Luther, which yesterday was Reformation Day, for, for those who don't know, uh, he used to beat himself, like physically. He would beat his body and do crazy things to discipline his body to obey Christ, but all that ascetic man-made religion only left him more miserable. It wasn't until he realized that it's Christ only who brings spiritual growth that he was like, oh, okay. So I don't need to beat myself up. I don't need to whip my back. I don't need to, you know, climb stairs and pray on my knees and get all bloody and, and beaten. I don't need, no, Christ did it all. Everything he needed was wrapped up in the works of Jesus Christ and he could add nothing and he could subtract nothing away from it. Christ is the substance. He's all we need. All the truth is found in him. And if we're, grow, we're going to grow spiritually, it's going to be a result of what he accomplished, not a result of what we do. That's just, that's just how it is. So this morning, I want you to perish the thoughts of adding anything to the gospel. You cannot earn God's favor by observing holy days or not observing holy days. You cannot earn God's favor by walking through, through rituals and rites. Now, I grew up surrounded by religious superstition. It took me years to get rid of that garbage out of my life. And even still, I have some, some inklings of it. Like yesterday, I was like, oh, great, it's a full moon. Oh, some, this day's going to suck. You know? Like, no. I'm like, no, wait a minute. That's nonsense. That's superstition. That's, that's the old life. I have to get rid of that kind of stuff. I grew up surrounded by religious superstition. And it can't help you. It can't help you spiritually. You know, different Christian denominations have a laundry list of their own rules. But, but church, if those rules aren't from God, then don't even worry about it. The Pharisees of Jesus' day did the same thing. They added to God's word and they burdened the people with rules and regulations. You know, on the Sabbath, uh, don't you dare pick a head of grain on the Sabbath. Like, come on. They burden them with nonsense. And, and I know it can be hard to discern sometimes what's man-made and what's God. But it's only hard to discern those things because maybe we just don't know what God has said. I mean, it's kind of a big book. Right? It's going to take you a long time to get through it and keep studying. But, but if you keep going through it, eventually you're going to, it'll be second nature to you. You'll be able to discern between right and wrong, what's deception, what's truth. But we have to know the book. We have to be people of the book, people who understand, people who internalize that Christ is the substance, that it's all in him that we need. Everything we need is wrapped up in this person called Jesus. His works are sufficient. He died on the cross. His blood cleanses us from sin. He did not die and rise from the dead only to say, all right, my part's done now. You know, you got to, you know, it's not a baton race. Jesus doesn't run half the race and go, your turn. Because we wouldn't win the race. <laughs> we wouldn't lose. Uh, who, who said, um, John MacArthur, he said, if I could lose my salvation, I would. If it was dependent on me. But thank God it's not dependent on me. He's the substance. He's the sufficient Savior. It's him. 
He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He didn't say my yoke is mediocre, my burden is sort of heavy, but I think you can do it. He said, it's easy, it's light. Why is it easy and light? It wasn't easy and light for him, it's easy and light for you. Because it wasn't easy and light for him. He doesn't burden us down with regulations and man-made religion. If you read through the Gospels, like, there's so many accounts of people coming to him with man-made regulations and him just shooting it down. Like Three quarters of his ministry was talking to religious people about how stupid their religion was. That was like most of what he did. And, and there's times in the Bible where Jesus gets like, you know, visibly frustrated with them. Like, How many times do I have to tell you guys that's not what it's about. That's not what God is, is requiring from you. He's not requiring from you religion. He's requiring what? Walk humbly with me. Have mercy on, on those uh, uh, who, who, who are, are suffering. Do justice. God cares more that you do justice than if you don't pick a head of grain. And this sent religious people into a tizzy. Oh, how could he say that? How could he say because he says, my father is working to this day. Oh man, that's, 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 that's offensive. That's offensive because, you're, because only God can work on the Sabbath. And Jesus is saying, my father, works, my father works until today and so do I. What is he saying? I'm God. If God can work on the Sabbath and you can work on the Sabbath, that means you're God. That offended them. He doesn't burden us with regulations. He gives us power to live holy lives and then our, his commands aren't burdensome. To me, it's not really a burden that I can't murder somebody. You know, it's not like, oh, I wish I could murder people, but God says I shouldn't. Oh, man, I wish I could just commit adultery all the time, but God says I don't. Oh, this is so hard. It, his command, it, they don't be, they're not a burden on us because his commandments become what? Life and peace, and we love them. Of course, we sin from time to time. We fall but we're convicted and we get up and we love God's law and we hate sin. That's the difference. So church, don't be deceived by legalism. Don't be deceived by centrist religion. Look to Christ who's the substance, the wellspring of all spiritual truth and growth. That's my whole message. I could have said it in two seconds, but I took 40 minutes. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your love. Um, Thank you for saving us, Lord, from deception and legalism and sensuous religion. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that we would look to you, uh, the substance of all truth, uh, Jesus, the King of kings. Uh, we need you so desperately. So reveal yourself to us, Lord, and help us to uh, keep at the forefront of our minds that which you really require, to, to walk humbly with you, to love mercy, and to do justice and to be people who, um, who can bear your name uh, well. We want to honor you and glorify you in this life, and we wait for your return, Lord. But until then, uh, we, we need you, and we're asking that you be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.